Hello everyone and welcome to Real Life Talks. I'm your host Yvonne Heath, author of the book Love Your Life to Death and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. So joining me today is Heather Hay. Hello Heather. Hi. I am in awe of everything you do I have to say and Heather and I we met about four years ago. Yep. Yes, I had reached out when I was writing my book, Love Your Life to Death, um, seeing what you were doing in the community, which we're gonna talk about. You, you actually wear, I'm sure, several hats, <laughs> but we're gonna talk about two of them today because uh, they're two very important subjects. And we um, had connected because you are the uh, coordinator at Elder Abuse Prevention. Muskoka. In yeah. Muskoka, yeah. yes, Muskoka Elder Abuse Prevention. And um, educating our community and advocating for our seniors. And uh, when I do research into subjects, sometimes it just really pulls up my heartstrings. And I know that elder abuse is a very real situation in our communities. And when I read, only one in six cases are reported. That it's hurts sad, my heart. Well, it's a sad story uh, because the main reason is because the often the person who's uh, conducting or, or, or uh, doing the abuse is either a family member or a uh, the the, per the caregiver, right. and so uh, the seniors are not you know don't necessarily want to involve the police in family matters, and uh, if it's a caregiver, if that's the only person providing support, oh. you don't want to cut off the your access to to the bigger community. Of course, and that that's just so sad. And I know that mm -hmm. um, the abuse comes in many different forms. And can you share a little bit about different ways that can happen? Well, one of the main forms of abuse that uh, our seniors are experiencing is financial abuse. Right. right? We, we have a, a problem with poverty in our area, so uh, seniors with regular incomes, pensions are often easy targets. Uh, often medications are also something that um, people oh. are stealing from, from right. seniors. You know, a, a fentanyl patch can go for, I'm not sure what it is on the street now, uh, right. 80 to $300, depending on if it's used or not. Of course. Um, so medications, uh, financial abuse, and uh, but and I have had seniors who say they know that their family members are taking advantage, but they're coming to visit them every week, and right, and they don't they don't care. Just put up with that. They they're not taking the money with them, and it's their choice. That there is no specific law against elder abuse. It's uh, just the regular oh. uh, laws about theft or assault, those kind of things that apply. So we don't have specific laws or uh, mandatory reporting unless it's in a, in a care home, either in a retirement or a long-term care home. Right, so if, it, if you are elderly and alone, so you either don't have them visiting or caring for you anymore, you also have to have the courage to report it and prove it, I would assume. Well, it's, and it's a long, a long process. The the justice Ugh. system, and a lot of times, the senior just wants the abuse to stop. You yes. know, and is is the court system necessarily the best way of making that happen? You know, sometimes they just need more supports. A lot of times, it's caregiver burnout. That can be a main. And that's a huge one. Right. You know, yes. it's a, a senior or your 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 son is taking care of you. Uh, he may not be aware that you can't smell and aren't aware of, of cleanliness or yes. that you can't reach your toes and uh, that's not a conversation, personal care that you, you have with some family sure. members. So um, it, sometimes it's just about a matter of getting the supports in place so that uh, the person can remain a bit more independent in their home. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. of course that also goes very in line with my mission of talking about planning and preparing for things mm -hmm. long before we are facing them. Mm -hmm. We're all going to get, well, we're all either going to die first or we're going to get older and perhaps need care. So, so it, having those powers of attorney are the key, key yes, things. Yes, so okay. That you can have, because those are ongoing conversations. Yes. There's the two different ones, one for financial. Right. And then the other one for personal care. Yes. And you want to have ongoing conversations about what your wishes are as mm -hmm. your needs change. You know, my sister who uh, is a year younger than me said the only tattoo she's ever going to get is a DNR on her Do chest. Do not resuscitate <laughs> me. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. But, but you know, that may have been different when she was younger. Of course. So depending on your age and, and your responsibilities, the level of treatment that you'll pursue changes as as your condition changes. And it, so it when needs it be to be an ongoing conversation. Ongoing conversation and be very clear about quality of life and quantity of life because mm -hmm. as I've also done a lot of research and many times it was like 70 percent of people who die in hospitals or intensive cares would have preferred just comfort measures and so sometimes if they recover then they require longer mm -hmm. care yeah. afterwards and they didn't want that to happen mm -hmm. so they're living a sick life that they did not want that isn't enough quality for them and they're requiring more care and families didn't foresee this and it just spirals it spirals it spirals mm -hmm. Do your power of attorney <laughs> no. for health care now yeah. and for financial yeah. long before. And wouldn't it be so wonderful to And make sure you do? specify when those go into effect. Okay. Right? That's yes. a key, key factor. A lot of times people, um, especially for financial, that uh, deter decide who you want to make the decision that you are no longer capable mm -hmm. or have that as a requirement. Because if you just sign the power of attorney without a requirement that you will not be incapable before it come into effect, they can take that document to the bank and empty your bank account, sell your property and anything else mm -hmm. if there's nothing specifying when it comes into effect. Now see, okay, so I thought power of attorney only came into effect when you were for not personal mentally care. Ca okay for personal care. Yeah. Oh, so for fine. Ooh, mm -hmm. that's a big aha moment. Mm -hmm. So if you sign a power of attorney for your estate for your financial and mm -hmm. you don't specify that's when it comes into when effect. When it comes into and effect. Who makes that decision? You know, is it the family doctor decides right, right what, that you're no longer able to make capable. the decision? Yeah. But if you sign it ahead, even if you're mentally capable, they can start. If you don't specify, then that document can be used to. to <gasps> it's the same as you signing. Heather, I didn't know that. Yes. That is very important. So you see that there mm -hmm. and again. It's why it's so important to have these conversations mm -hmm. long before you need them to under truly understand. See, you don't know what you don't know. I didn't know and that. And sometimes people try to think, well, I'll make it so I've got two, two kids and I'll make it so they both have to sign off. Right. That can be a bit challenging and we don't generally recommend that because okay. uh, trying to get, you know, the mortgage paid or bills paid when you have to get two signatures from two separate people living in separate places can, can be challenging. So usually for, for that you might have uh, an or situation so that one or the other can. Right. Um, but one of the things we suggest is if you have one uh, person who's in charge of personal care and another person who's in charge of the, the finances. Okay. Right? So generally the person who's closest would be the person who uh, would be in charge of your personal care course, because they can there. advocate yes. for you. We know you get better treatment in, in, in care yes. if you have somebody visiting on a regular basis. Exactly. And and another really huge thing for those power of attorneys who, you know, it, that's a big responsibility, find out what the supports are in your community, mm -hmm. right? I think that's also a very big prevention piece for your own burnout. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have seen people who are trying to take care of this parent and then they're li they have their life and they're working and another parent gets it's sick. I mean, it just mm -hmm. because you are taking care of one person doesn't mean the rest of life isn't going to demand all your attention. And I can see mm -hmm. how people get burnt out. But that's another piece for caregivers. And if you can't meetings, handle it, ha bring yes. in the family together okay. and, and have circles of care so that you can talk about uh, what the changes are. Because a lot of times, if if you're the person nearby, it can um, fall on you more. It, it can fall on you more, and you don't notice the deterioration right. in, in, okay. in, in someone's that's condition, and sure. that maybe they do need more supports. You, you know, you're that frog, the temperature just keeps going up, and yes. you just kind of keep yeah. taking on more and realize, right. okay, we're at a point now where not that you're not able to do it it's just that we need to provide more support for it's you. too much yeah, it's, too, it's much. too much for one person yeah. and I've seen it in my mm -hmm. 30 years of nursing I saw a caregiver burnout over and over and over again and here's another piece is often 
perhaps the person that needs the care is like, oh, I don't want strangers in my house, mm -hmm. right? It, do you, but then there's, there's devices that you can get. We had uh, one case where um, you know the the mother was in a wheelchair, uh, the father was the caregiver, and he just couldn't handle her constant verbal needs, yes. and so he would go out into the garden, and she would feel very uh, un safe yes, being alone okay. in the house. Mm -hmm. So they were able to get a device that hooks up to the phone and so when she presses the button it dials the first sibling or the first mm. offspring and then the next and then a neighbor right. and then the last number is 911. Right. So she just knowing that she wasn't trapped just gave her that safe that sense of security. Yeah. Not necessarily bringing somebody else into the house but a way for her to to reach out or have a bit more independence. So of there's, course. there's sometimes there's solutions ways. we can... But I also feel like mm -hmm. often when the care is too much and it's like, I don't want strangers in the house, sometimes it can't be that person's choice when you no. don't have, it's like, I wish I could do it all on my own, but I cannot, I'm burning out. And, and to have that self-realization and people feel guilty, you know, dad doesn't want strangers in the house, so they don't have nurses coming in. They're gonna steal my stuff, <laughs> I hear all mm -hmm. that but you cannot do it alone and you need to check in and reach out right and and so with um with the website which we'll share mm -hmm. if they called you if they called the organization can they find out what supports are out there or what's the we've produced a, a guide called the seniors resource guide for right. muskoka and perry yes. sound that okay. has it, it stays open it has yes. bigger print and uh, lists oh, as many of the resources and it is as current as we've been able to 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 get it yeah um so it has housing health uh, all the different services and needs that we think might be of use to seniors um, in one place. It's also available on the website. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. there is support out there. Yeah. And, and, and we do have our 1-800 number as well as the local number um, that comes to me if, uh, if uh, there's an issue. Oftentimes it's just verbal support or resources or re referrals, um, but sometimes we have been able to Sometimes people just want to know that they have a choice. That's right. And, so, and for somebody to listen. Yeah, so so let's share the 1-800 number, Heather. I'll just uh, do the, the local number, 705-646-7677. Okay. All right, and the mm -hmm. website is? Is uh, elderabuseprevention.ca. All right, and so, so the important first steps is make sure your power of attorney for personal care, financial care is in order. Mm -hmm update it and make sure you're saying when when it comes into when effect. it comes into effect and who that makes is, the decision who makes the decision and yeah. um, and and find out your resources get mm -hmm. that senior guide look through yep. peruse through and say oh I didn't know about this or this and of course with a being a caregiver check in with yourself often be a great self care giver, as is the most important thing you can do, right? Yep. Get respite care. Get respite care. And I think another piece also, as a neighbor, any community member, I always say we are all each other's responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the whole, that's none of my business, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if someone is not being cared for. If you've noticed a change in somebody's living situation, somebody else has moved in, you're, they're not as, they're a bit more isolated, knock on the door, just check in, see if you can provide some support. There you go. If you see something, say something, right? That's if right. you're concerned. And if you're not sure, call our number and there we can go. always arrange a wellness check if, you, if it's okay. a safety concern or um, you know, maybe get CCAC to, mm -hmm. or the, the new yeah, whatever it is called now, I have no uh, idea, I can't keep up. But yeah. yes, but I think that that is also a really important piece mm -hmm. that, you know, if you if you see something or you have a concern, go with your instinct. Mm -hmm. Don't just say, I have a concern, but, you know, I don't want to. I don't and ask wanna... the person, hey, no, how are you doing? There's an idea. How, how are, are things? things? Life looks, looks different. How are, how are you managing with the changes? Okay. And just check in. Yes. Because let them decide when, the, when change or if they need to be rescued because they might be okay with the situation but just knowing that you're there and willing to listen to them as they're navigating it can be right. really important. Right, and um, one last question I don't even want to ask it but is there a lot of physical abuse with our our elderly population? Um, there's some, it's more neglect I think okay. is, is more the, the issue. Um, we're not seeing huge amounts of physical assaults, Just um, more some neglect. sexual assaults in 
you know, be among seniors in long-term care, that kind right. of thing. Um, it's, it's more the issue of capacity and consent right. uh, sometimes. Yes. And uh, we're having to navigate an aging population with some of those ethical issues. Yes. At what point are you allowed to have sex <laughs> as an older person? Oh, I don't think we have enough time, enough time to go time into that one. <laughs> I don't even think we have enough time to go into all that. Yeah. But it truly is about rights, respect, mm -hmm. and and many of our seniors are living in isolation. And I just think as a community, again, it takes a village to support the elder caregiver, mm -hmm. the dying, the bereaved, and each other. Check in with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. or just, you know, sort of have that antenna out, right? Like just kind of pay attention if you have an elderly neighbor Show up down with the muffins. road. Shop with muffins, <laughs> absolutely. And, and maybe how wonderful to stop in for a cup of tea mm -hmm. if they're alone and, and mm -hmm. just check in. And sometimes people feel like if they can't do everything, they do nothing. But mm -hmm. those sometimes, those visits are the only visits they have. Mm -hmm. And it means the world to them. And if they are struggling, maybe you're a person that can make you might that be the call. lifeline yeah you might be that lifeline so i think that's a mm -hmm. a really uh, a really great way to end this part of our talk because we have much more to chat about but it is an important issue and again i think the thing is for people to just 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 be more aware of mm -hmm. our elderly they deserve they deserve respect and they deserve to be a part of our community and if they are isolated do something just a little something about it right be the one who cares be the one who cares I love that be the one who cares I would like to get a t-shirt that says that um, speaking of t-shirts and on to our other subject because I don't even know how you do all that you do but so this is kind of your day job right the elderly abuse, Elder part. abuse is one part of my day one job part of your yeah. day job and yeah. so now you are also I'm very excited to say the president of Fierte Canada Pride. That's right. So that's the no National Association of Pride Organizations. So yes. We have uh, a, about 125 prides across the country. Wow. And about 50 are currently members of our organization. So the big prides, Toronto and uh, Halifax, Vancouver, Winnipeg, and many small ones in between are, are members. Yes, and so what is the mission of your organization? So our, our mission is to bring prides together um, and advocate on behalf of our members. So one of the things that we've been working on in the last year is uh, working with the LGBTQ 2 i I'm not sure exactly which L letters they use, uh, Secretariat, um, in advocating for a national action plan for oh, okay. LGBT uh, dealing with our community and having a, a means for which we can uh, engage with the federal government because right. it's sort of a little bit challenging right now. So and and just so that anybody who doesn't know um, and and I wrote or I saw on the website mission is to develop a national identity of pride and offer resources and advocacy for its members and advocate for over 1.2 million Canadians. Mm -hmm. Right, that identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. 1.2 million. Well, probably more than well, that. Well, yes, yeah. at that time yeah. that they wrote. I think in last year um, at our at our AGM of the uh, organizations present, we had over four million people attend our pride events um, just in last year alone. Wow. So that, yes, yeah. well, that's incredible. Well, and as I shared. Yeah. I got the T-shirt, <laughs> yes. right? I got the T-shirt. I'm one of our main I'm, sponsors, TD. Yes, very yeah. excited that last year mm -hmm. in Muskoka, so in Bracebridge, actually, they not only had a Muskoka Pride event, but they had a parade, mm -hmm. and uh, and we proudly marched in the parade. And I, and I was sharing with you, I was with my children and my sister-in-law and her kids, and we rounded the corner. We thought, you know, this is the first Pride parade in Muskoka. There may be nobody there, mm -hmm. right? And, and and that's okay. And we turn that corner and there are people clapping and cheering on both sides of the street. And then they had a great big event and music. And it was truly a magical, it was a magical day. And I, I felt very proud of our community, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Visibility is a huge, huge 
tool that we use, I guess, to to reach out to especially in isolated communities like yes. Muskoka for seeing those pride events can can save a life for many. Can literally, yeah. yes. And so yeah. so when you talk about um, advocacy, what is still one of the there are many challenges. What is one of the greatest challenges? And when you say safety or what is one of the greatest challenges um, for the LGBTQ community? Uh, right now, um, I'd say poverty is really one of the biggest challenges facing our community because really? many of the marginalized within our community uh, are have a greater disproportion of poverty, lack of uh, housing, secure uh, employment, that kind, of, all those issues that go with. Um, being one of the marginalized part of our community. Because people aren't hiring someone because mm. they know they're gay or transgender, is that yeah, what or you're saying? Or if they're people of color and queer. Yes. Like it's the intersectionality within our community and it's starting for us to recognize that. That's been a huge education piece. Okay. Uh, within, so within Canada Pride, one of our missions has been to, at our, our annual conference, to educate our members on how to reach out to the marginalized members of our community. Because traditionally, Pride has been organized by and for uh, those who have the greatest income, which is the white males, okay. pre predominantly, right? Dual income. Mm -hmm. uh, so often women or people of color or trans members of our community, there haven't been as many activities uh, focused on you know, giving them the stage or, or the meeting right. their needs. So okay. and recognizing their, that they're being queer and a person of color, or being yes. queer and Muslim, or, or, or those intersections mm -hmm. can often uh, create additional challenges for our members. And so we need to be even more proactive in how we reach out safely to, to those so members of our community. Yeah. And so, what are the greatest steps? So, so as a community member myself, mm -hmm. what what are some positive steps that we as community members who believe in rights mm -hmm. respect and it, I mean mm -hmm. it really is just respect but inclusion you know I they like said you love who you love I'm not mm -hmm. really concerned about who someone loves I care about how they treat themselves others mm -hmm. the earth and if we have that those same values in common then we can be friends. The rest, mm -hmm. to me, is really none of my business. Actually, <laughs> like it just, I just yeah. find it so interesting. Like, you love who you love. That really has nothing. It's none of my but business. But sometimes anyway. it's about taking those, creating a space for a voice that doesn't often get on a stage. Yeah. And getting, giving them the the extra time with the microphone. And, okay. And 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 being willing to hear their story mm -hmm. and, and give them. Uh, you know, so a trans person and what, what having we, we a lot of people have opinions on trans rights as if human rights um, <laughs> require your approval. That's so or, interesting. Or right. having an opinion about. Because I feel right? you you yeah. have value and you matter and you have rights because you mm -hmm. exist. I, I think that should be the only criteria. You exist. So. so. But but for for trans youth, um, uh, what kind of supports are in place for them? Um, we know that uh, almost. 43% I think of trans individuals attempt suicide before transition you know that's a that's a health oh crisis my goodness. you know that's so it's just so devastating so when people think that that's something they can have a, 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 a intellectual discussion about um, that that's a kid who's more at risk right where right. like when we decide that that that's that we're not calling those conversations as homophobic or transphobic mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know whatever the hate speech and saying no um, you know a kid's life is not worth you know you having your right to uh, spew your hate right and, you know. I, yeah, and I did, I read, and I know I don't have the statistic right, but uh, either gay, transgender child who has family support or mm -hmm. support of their community, the, like, the risk of suicide is so minimal Middle, compared yeah. to when they don't. And that, that's just heartbreaking to me because they end it's up pretty, on the streets. Yeah, you know. it's pretty easy to be supportive, mm -hmm. you know. And I, like Michelle Empson, a mm -hmm. lovely uh, friend of ours who is a transgender woman advocate, she's out there. And I had her on the show, and I, and listening to her story, it just like my throat was closing, just mm -hmm. all that, you know, self loathing uh, of going through all of that and not having all of that support. And fast forward to today, she is just a glowing, lovely, just mm -hmm. a lovely, good-hearted person. 
and that's that's why we're friends because she is a good-hearted person and I know others who who have had that support you know support in their community mm -hmm. and it's just kindness and and yep. just inclusion you know it's not it's not rocket science it's, and it's simple things like instead of saying um, you, you change your language get rid of the gender in our language you know we, we don't have to say guys and gals we yeah. can say everyone everyone ladies okay. and gentlemen we don't have to it, remove the gender from our language so that the gender queer and those who aren't fitting into our binary system right. uh, can feel a bit more included okay. introduce yourself with your pronouns I use the pronouns have she and her you know so that it's not just our trans sisters and brothers who have to uh, introduce themselves as they them or whatever pronouns they might prefer right or use sorry it's not a preference right yeah I think it's just a matter of and again more awareness and mm -hmm. having these conversations and and being educated right like mm -hmm. being out there and, and get outside of your comfort zone into the the community and find a way to bring people who are more marginalized into um, the center of our circles instead yes. of on the outside. That's so significant. And there are so many mm -hmm. marginalized people for all kinds of different mm -hmm. reasons. And it's just, to me, it is we Use are, your privilege. You know, yes. You've got to use it, you know, we, especially if there's somebody else there. How, what can you do to what bring somebody else? What can you else? do? And there is nothing. It's such a great... You, you, your heart feels so much better when you extend a little kindness. You mm -hmm. know, it's easy to, yeah, run in your circle and everything's fine and you have a great job and this and that. Yeah. Although we're still all so stressed, which is, again, a whole other story. A little bit of meditation helps. <laughs> yes, a little meditation would be good. Yeah. But just extending that kindness. And again, it's kindness and connection. Those kindness and connection. Mm -hmm. And once again, kind of being more aware of your your neighborhood be the one who cares <laughs> be the see it is the same message it is the isn't same it message, yeah. be the one who cares mm -hmm. and i stand up to the bullying stand yes. up to the yeah you will feel so much better mm -hmm. as a human being right mm -hmm. for being the one who cares that's right uh, so the website where people can get information fiercecanadapride.org yes and um, and they can get information there and hear about the parades and everything else and you can get the t-shirt I will go. be there next year Heather I cannot express how grateful I am for everything that you do in our community for Thank so you for many this people opportunity. yes I I'm delighted to share this message and will continue to be an advocate for isolated and marginalized people everywhere. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So thank you for joining us at Real, for Real Life Talks. This is a show about learning how to just show up for yourself and just show up for others and sometimes have conversations that we don't always have. Maybe it's hard to talk about and that's okay. So if you want to be empowered and you want to be resilient, you want to be able to just show up for yourself and others, my call to action is always plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always, bring your own tambourine to the party. Thanks, bye for now. Mm -hmm.